I'm Justin McRoberts, and you are listening to the Title Pending Audio Series, a collection of readings focused on moments in my own creative history that I hope shed an inspired light on yours. Part 1. Get Your Bearings. Chapter 1. The Mountain. I started taking my son hiking when he was about two years old. Though he is very young, he clearly enjoyed the outdoors. I think it's the dirt he liked best. I remember moments during hikes when I would point at a hawk in flight overhead or pause to stare at a new calf learning to walk behind its mother, only to turn around and find my son with a mouthful of mud saying, Dad, dirt! We all have our tastes and preferences. Now, when I say that I took my son hiking, what I actually mean is that I went hiking and carried my son on my back in his Kelty Kid backpack, probably the best Craigslist purchase I've ever made. Asa just hangs out back there, asking for cheese and grapes while I trudge up the hill, carrying the extra weight. It's a good deal for him, and it keeps him from eating as much dirt. One of our first hiking adventures was tromping around the beautiful and enchanting lower half of Mount Diablo, while he chewed chunks of cheddar in my ear. Described by geologists as a geologic anomaly, Mount Diablo's unique volcanic ancestry makes it visible from just about any place in the greater San Francisco Bay Area. In fact, from the peak of Diablo, it's estimated by people who do math while hiking, apparently, that one can see 13,000 square miles of California. My family lives only a few miles from the mountain, so we see it every day like a constant reminder of our place on the planet. On our way to this first hike, while we're still about seven miles away, I started talking to Asa about the mountain, which towered in the near distance. There it is, I'd say. And he'd reply by kicking around in his car seat, shouting, mountain, hike it, mountain, hike it. But as we got closer, we could only catch glimpses of it between the trees and hills that formed Diablo's footing. And then once we were actually on the mountain, we really couldn't see the mountain at all. That is, not in any way we'd come to recognize as seeing the mountain. We could only see the trail we were on, the rocks, the trees, and the stream that ran down Mitchell Canyon. As I lifted him out of his car seat, Asa looked past me and asked, where mountain go? <laughs> we're on the mountain, pal, this is it. He looked at me with that sad, funny, serious face only toddlers can really muster and said again, where mountain go? I promise this is it, son. We're standing on Mount Diablo. Here is something true. A mountain doesn't look like a mountain when you're on it. Often enough, it doesn't look like much at all, like standing only a few inches away from one of artist Jura Seurat's pieces, where all I see are points of color. It's just dots. Of course, there is some truth to that, isn't there? Seurat's work does, in fact, consist of thousands upon thousands of tiny dots of color, yet... I'd venture a guess that Seurat was not primarily or initially moved by a vision of tiny dots on a canvas. I bet he was moved by a vision of sand and grass and water and skin and eyes, and that those millions of tiny marks he diligently, meticulously made with his brush were how he chose to make that vision come to life. So it is with you and me, when we choose to make art. Asa and I had seen Mount Diablo from a distance, for most of our journey to the mountain. But it seemed to him that instead of arriving at the mountain he'd been seeing, we'd ended up somewhere else entirely, somewhere far less interesting. The mountain doesn't look like the mountain when you're on it, neither will the song you're working on, or the album, or the essay, or the book, the painting, etc. Whatever it is you're working on, once you're really working on it, will probably look a lot more like work than an album, essay, book, or painting. I can't tell you how many times I've had an inspiring idea or vision for a project and been powerfully motivated to start working on it, only to quickly lose that sense of inspired motivation once the idea was replaced by the tedious process of putting one foot in front of the other and actually making it happen. Unfortunately for me, I've far too often given up in those moments when the creative process pulled this apparent bait and switch on me. No longer inspired by a grand sweeping vision for the idea or the result, rather faced by the details and challenges of the work itself, I've dropped projects I should have carried through to completion. Anyone can work on something when they're inspired. Art takes more than inspiration. I want to make art. I'm learning to appreciate the mountain for the dust of the trail, the heat, the work of the climb. 
and I'm learning to appreciate art for the process by which it's actually made. About midway through 2011, I set to work on a project I'd formed in my mind and been deeply moved by. It's a collision of songs, personal letters, visual art, and reflective essays called the CMYK Project. From the outset, it was an enormous endeavor, and in its initial form, it looked like a full-color book with accompanying music, all of which was, again, truly... But 12 months or so into the project, I was staring at a spreadsheet with the project elements listed as either completed or incomplete. And I wondered to myself, where did the project go? This didn't look at all like the collection of essays or letters or visual art or an album. It looked like a spreadsheet. And that's not very inspiring unless you're the kind of person who likes spreadsheets, in which case you also might be the kind of person who does math while hiking. What I've learned is this, the dry details in front of me were, in fact, the project as it appears while standing that close to it. Just like the 400 feet of dirt and clay I could see that day with my son was the It was the part of the mountain I could attend to right then in that moment. And just like I can't leap to the top of the hill in one spring, I have to apply myself to the process of making art and the manageable details of the big idea. This book, now in your hand, is not a collection of moments and stories I've captured while being inspired. It's a collection of things I've learned and thoughts I've had while doing the work of creating. Inspiration generally gets me to the foot of the mountain, but once I'm there, inspiration often fizzles because the mountain doesn't look like the mountain anymore. It looks like a steep hill. It looks like lots of short steps carrying a cheese-obsessed toddler on my back. It looks like a spreadsheet or a blank page instead of a finished book. It looks like cliche and bad transitions instead of a song. In short, it looks like work. That's because it is work. And if it's not work, I'd sincerely question if it's art. Inspiration gets us started, but at some point, we simply have to get to work. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Title Pending Audio Series. If you've enjoyed listening and you'd like to take another step or two in the direction of your own creative process, navigate your way to yourcreativeprocess.info. And there you'll find an online course I've designed for you.